going to start off the ball rolling with alternative sentencing. And we all know, um, we talk about alternative sentencing and we talk about uh, institutional, uh, what we call custodial sentencing. And like I stated yesterday, in the Bahamas, we have, we have uh, one of the highest uh, inmate per capita, in we have one of the highest incarceration rates in the English speaking Caribbean. And that might lend itself to, uh, we're not using alternative sentencing uh, guidelines effectively. When we find out, and I know that uh, BDOX can attest to this, when you have a high percentage, a very high percentage of offender population for what we call nonviolent offenses, there's something wrong with the system when you're gonna overcrowd your correctional space and not utilizing. And I know Chinabu, uh, uh, he can attest to this with Trinidad, although he is now in Jamaica, with Trinidad having a population, country population of 1.7 or one around about, and having at least eight facilities. And you don't have incarcerate, the incarceration population, I don't think is more than uh, 4,000. I don't think it's more than 4,000. I can be corrected the last time I would have checked. But here in the Bahamas, we have a population of almost 400,000, 375,000 population. And we have an inmate population of almost 2,000. Uh, it flows around 1,600 to 1,800, basically. So both, I would say on average, because it's over 1,500, it's on average to about almost 2,000. And so something needs to be addressed as it relates to our criminal justice system. And also yesterday I spoke about the criminal justice system being made up of three tiers. You have the courts or you have law enforcement, you have the courts and you have corrections. And if one of those tiers seem to be weaker than the other, then the whole criminal justice system is falling down. So the police might be doing their job really good. Uh, the courts might be doing their job good. And if corrections isn't doing their job uh, because of lack of resources and because of lack of infrastructure and all of those things, then we will fall down in the criminal justice system. Now, my take from my perspective as a correctional specialist and working in the field, I feel as though corrections has a vital role to play in the criminal justice system as it relates to alternative sentencing and custodial sentencing, because the correctional system is made up of institutional corrections and community corrections. And community corrections focus more on alternative sentencing and the parole system. So if we don't get it right here in our country, then we will continue to see the revolving door that is going around and around and around, seeing offenders coming in and offenders going out. So that being said, we will share a tad bit on community corrections and alternative sentencing and how it plays a role in our communities today. Yesterday, we focused just a tad bit on institutional corrections and the role that corrections play in the criminal justice system. The problem, crime has become an increasingly vexing problem throughout the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. And not only the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, but if we look in St. Lucia, I know St. Lucia had some issues a year or two ago with uh, uh, sexual offenses and other offenses. And the last time I was in place in St. Lucia, I know they had a prison population of just over 600 inmates, but they did not have uh, the required specialists needed to deal with these individuals. And so crime in the Caribbean 
on, on the whole has become an increasingly vexing problem throughout the Bahamas and the Caribbean. And I would, it's safe to say as an addiction professional, it's safe to say that there's an ineffective war on drugs. If we look back, back in the 80s, the 70s, the 80s, the war was, the war on drugs was mainly on cocaine and marijuana. And now we move towards the 90s and 2000s. And what we are seeing now is that a, the war on drugs now is not even a war on drugs because the war on drugs mainly came because of the marijuana. And most of the marijuana was coming out of Caribbean or South American countries and traveling up north. And so now we're seeing in this day and time, they switch from the war on drugs. And so they look at what we call it, the opioid pandemic or the opioid crisis. And so, and we know uh, why that is so, because you have a different socioeconomic grouping of individuals that is being dealt with or being that are involved in those type of medicated drugs and abuse or misuse of those type of substances. And so you have a different approach. And so it's being now looked at from a medical or public health approach, whereas the war on drugs was mainly in the 70s, the 80s, and the early 90s basically was from a criminal justice standpoint. And that is the problem we see here today. So at the National Lead Institute, this year we focus on the year. This year is the, at the Institute is directed to focus on reset. Reset of the lives of those who are challenged with substance use disorder, and particularly those who have gone afoul of the law and educating those who are most at risk within the educational system. The solution, LEAD's overall mission is to reduce crime and drug demand through proven strategies and development evidence-based and best practices programs that will greatly benefit our communities that have been negatively affected by crime and other social ills. We talk about breaking out of the silos. LEAD has partnered with not only the police force, the defense force, social services, Department of Welfare and Rehabilitative and Welfare Services, but other agencies, other civil society, other civil society organizations to assist in bringing forward the solutions because we don't believe that one agency or one individual or one entity has all the answers. We believe through collaboration, we believe in, 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 in strengthening where we think or where we see strategically weak links so that we all as organizations can fully reach our organizational capacity to effectively roll out the solutions the mandated that we are mandated to roll out as stakeholders in this fight to create a more safer, productive, and peaceful society. So let's look at the legal framework of alternative sentencing. And this is for the Bahamas. On chapter 104 of the Offenders Community Service and Supervision Order, an act to make provision for empowering the courts to make a community service or supervision order in respect of convicted persons and for matters incidental thereto, assent 8th of November 1999. So basically, what this legal framework or this legal framework has given us is that court system, whether you're a magistrate, whether you are a judge, can actually utilize this forum and use 
NGOs, civil society, and even government agencies that work in community corrections, such as the probation area, uh, instead of giving custodial sentencing. Also further in the legal framework, we have uh, quote unquote officers, includes a social welfare officer, a probation officer, a police officer, a justice of the peace, a minister of religion, the head of government department or such officer as may be designated by him, a principal and education officer, the chief executive officer of a prescribed organization or any other person who in the opinion of 45 of 1999 short title. So all of these areas give the legitimate uh, insight for a lot of those minor offenses and a lot of those offenses that are nonviolent that can be uh, help, helping the offender rehabilitate from the offense that he or she may have committed instead of sending them directly to uh, what we call uh, uh, our correctional facility to serve time and be punished. So you can also use in this with alternative sentence, and I will give you more uh, information on the alternative sentencing framework that there can be what we call shock incarceration. Whereas an individual who has committed an offense never, uh, uh, never had previous offenses can be given short-term work at a, at a correctional facility and then release on a parole system in the community to continue their sentencing. So you can do it both ways. You can give them probation or you can give them shock incarceration and release on parole. So the interpretation of chapter 97 section, uh, second schedule of chapter 104, offenders or community service and supervision orders, statute law of the Bahamas, the original service was in 201. The court is a proper person to undertake the responsibility of supervising and directing the offender. So basically, like I stated yesterday, the criminal justice system, which is made up of three tiers, the courts adjudicate. The police, which is the main gatekeepers of the criminal justice system, will actually enforce the laws. Now you have other entities in law enforcement because you have immigration that does law enforcement. You have customs in some, although that might be on the Ministry of Finance, they do some form of law enforcement. Uh, you have the fisheries, I said the fisheries, they do some form of law enforcement and other agencies that do minor. And some of them basically when come time for prosecution, usually most of them go through the police prosecution to in the court system to adjudicate. And so with the police or law enforcement, and they will, you'll put those on the law enforcement, being the, what we call the gatekeepers of the criminal justice system. And once that is their rest in there, then you have the courts who basically has the responsibility for adjudicating the matters and the responsibility or supervising and erecting an offender whether he or she should get what we call a custodial sentencing or a community sentencing as such. And so let's look at some forms of alternative sentencing. You have suspended sentence, whereas uh, a person was found guilty of an offense and instead of them being sent to prison or even given a community service, they're given a suspended sentence for a period of time that if they violate any societal norms, then he or she will have to either do the community service or get a custodial sentence. Then your probation, your probation, whereas you're convicted of an offense and you're given you, you uh, a report is actually written on you and then the courts decide, okay, then this person is prepared and best suited for probation. 
and your fines uh with fines you just you know what fines are basically you pay monetary fees then you have restitution and restitution is a part but i don't want to touch on restorative justice because we have somebody who is an expert on restorative justice who will be on the panel we have several persons who are a part of restorative justice who are excellent in this area we'll talk about this but restitution is a part of alternative sentencing you know, somebody break up somebody's car, instead of sending them to jail for three months, you, and they have a good job, you say, okay, then we're going to garnish your salary, and you will have to pay to replace that windshield. And in addition, you will do community service. In our programming at the Lead Institute, one of the steps of the 12 steps program, which is cognitive behavioral in their treatment approach, uses some form of community service, but we don't call it community service because when we look at community service, we, uh, our clients think of community service as a form of punishment. So what we call it in our programming is public service. So it's taking on the initiative or it's taking on the concept where individual has to do at least 20 hours of public service where they have to help individuals who they do not know without getting anything in return and because they would have violated some societal norms or laws. And then you have deferred adjudication and pretrial diversion. And I have seen this work very well in the Cayman Islands during my tenure in the Cayman Islands with uh, the Department of Community Rehabilitation in the Cayman Islands. What happens is that if somebody was brought before the courts and this individual let's say was for a domestic matter and before the case is adjudicated they would send this person to anger management class with with the department of probation or they will conflict resolution and what will happen with this deferred re, uh it doesn't say this person's innocent or guilty but what it does it cuts down on the reoffending, because this person was enrolled in an evidence-based uh, research-driven program that actually deals directly with his or her issues. And then your pretrial diversion. And pretrial diversion is similar. And I know this is used in the state of Florida and many states throughout the United States. And um, also, when I was a probation officer working with the Department of Rehabilitative and Welfare Services, I actually engaged in one of this with the Attorney General Office, and I, I, I got in problems with my superior because I was only, uh, 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 what we call, I was only a small fry then dealing with this. But nevertheless, what happened was that uh, we were able to divert this person out of the criminal justice system. And then you have miscellaneous alternatives. Miscellaneous alternatives uh, basically deals with, uh, in, I know in the States they, they do with DUI cases where they have individuals who must install breathalyzers devices in their cars so that their car wouldn't even start if they go to a bar or a club and they left the uh, uh, club with alcohol on their breath and their car basically would not stand. Or the individual have to give lecture or teach classes about dangers of criminal behavior, attend lectures given by crime victims. Um, then you have complete a drug or alcohol treatment program, do weekend jail time, or stay at home under house arrest. So then it brings us to the Lead Institute. The reason why I'm sharing the Lead Institute, a community correctional and training organization is because we are one of the stakeholders who provide alternative sentencing for the offender population. And you see on the screen there, you see we are affiliated with uh, Liberty University Online Academy. We are affiliated with um, CCI MRT out of Germantown, Tennessee and also the Colombo Plan and the American Correctional Association. 
And we do all of this so that persons that volunteer or work in our employ, that they can get the training and the necessary, uh, uh, um, the necessary skill set so that they can effectively uh, uh, deliver the mandate, the services that we provide within the LEAD Institute and our subsidiaries. We've been offering uh, services in the harm reduction arena since 2009. And so a lot of things, uh, be, and one of the reasons why we got into the harm reduction area of our work was because doing our research, we have discovered that 65% of our offender population can be identified and was identified as suffering from some mental health disorder. And what we found out is that uh, with our research that we have done over the years, what we have discovered is that 65%, at least 65% of that population that came through our programs and services suffered from what we call antisocial personality disorder. And that is on uh, the DSM-5 scale as a mental illness. So therefore, we had to redefine, restructure what we do and how we provide our services so that we could have, so that we could have a greater impact on that demographic of individuals in the harm reduction area. Our vision and mission and goal, and I know many of you would have known that LEAD over the years, over the last actually 11 years, because it's our 12th year, over the last 11 years, our logo was totally different from this. We have just rebranded into this new look because we have taken on more responsibilities. We are expanding our network and we are collaborating with many other stakeholders. And also our vision statement, mission statements uh, have been changed. And so our new mission statement, vision statement is for every at-risk youth an offender to become a community leader and model citizen. Our mission statement, we build pathways from recovery to leadership within the at-risk and the offender communities. And our goal and aims, because we, we were a, a, a community correctional and we took on community correctional and training. And so our goal and aim and objective is to provide a cadre of competent professionals in order to design, implement evidence-based research-driven programs for at-risk offender communities, thus transforming them into community leaders. So we, that means we, our, our goal aim and objectives is already to work out of silos. So when we train a cadre of competent professionals, there will be persons in BDOCs that we would have trained, persons on the police force, that we would have trained persons on the defense force, persons in probation, persons in social services, persons in the wider community. We would have trained and certified as an organization to become competent professionals in order to design, implement evidence-based research. So it wasn't like, oh, we gotta do this. And if the light isn't shining on LEAD Institute, then we cannot carry out alternative sentencing. No, we do not believe in that because most of our, not most, all of our directors and, and, and workers, you know, educators, uh, defense force officers, uh, uh, work in probation. And so we had a cadre of persons all around that work along with us to actually make this possible. Specific objectives, basic is develop a, develop, manage, and administer programs to produce certified professionals to provide personal and professional development services to design and implement personal and development programs for the at-risk and the offender communities that will transform their lives, advance leadership potential. And we always focus on leadership because that's important because we believe in every follower and every one of our clients, there is leadership potential. 
We facilitate positive development. We facilitate positive development approaches to design and implement special programs to enhance the skill sets for the at risk and the offender communities and our core values. And the reason why I'm sharing with this, because civil society and all organizations, and we talk about organizational capacity, should have mission, vision, and objectives, along with core values. And if you want to be an effective alternative sentencing uh, organization, then you must have these key components. And our core values is respect, ingenuity, integrity, stewardship. So we value the, the dignity, humanity, and attributes of all individuals and are driven to improve the quality of life for Bahamians, Americans, and citizens of the Caribbean. Why we say Americans? Because we are 501C established in the state of North Carolina. We closed our office down last year, March, due to uh, the pandemic. And hopefully in the late fall, we can reopen it with the uh, Department of Public Safety in North Carolina there to offer our services. And we do a lot of training in the Caribbean as well. And also because we are home base in the Bahamas, New Providence and in Grand Bahama, we respect the dignity, humanity of and attributes of all of those individuals. Ingenuity, we research, develop, and apply new approaches, concepts, and technology to develop effective and successful programs. And guess what? You know how we were able to do that? We got consultation from persons at BDOCs all the time over the last 11 years. From the initial startup, we were having consultation with professionals. And I say professionals because, you know, it's sad to say you have a many, you have a lot of educated, qualified, certified individuals, correctional officers at BDOCs that are not given their due or just dessert, I should say, as it relates to their professions. And I believe, you know, no, 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 no head out to you guys who are in the police force, law enforcement, or in immigration or in defense force. But I believe that correctional officers are one of the hardest working uh, civil servants within the Commonwealth of Bahamas. Why I say this? It's because 95% of the individuals who are incarcerated are coming home. The question isn't when they're coming home. The question is when they're coming home or how they're coming home, I should say. And you know who oversees how they're coming home? Those same officers at Bahamas Department of Correctional Services. So don't mind what you see, the, some of the negative, what the media is trying to blow up in the media. These individuals work just as hard and in many instances, doubly harder than many of our civil servants. So I just had to plug, put a plug in there uh, for my colleagues at the Bahamas Department of Correctional Services. Integrity, we do what we say, knowing that honor and reputation are the foundation for credibility, trust, and success. Stewardship, we faithfully, so somebody give us $5,000 and we say we're gonna get computers with that, we're gonna use that for computers. They're not gonna take the $5,000 and say, hey, we're gonna honor. $5,000 vacation, or we're going to Walmart, or we're going to Target to actually do that. No, we're not going to do that because we believe in accountability. And our contacts as an alternative organization is in Grand Bahama, 602 1768. In New Providence, you can contact us through 525 3749, and in North Carolina and the US. 7140500. And because of our work that we have been doing over the years, our organization was awarded by Ministry of Youth and Sports and Culture as the most outstanding organization of the year 2011 and 2012. And we've been trying to get that back ever since. But you know, they will always want to share around the goodies with other organizations. So hopefully, 2021, 2022, we can get that back.
And so let's look at why we are an alternative organization as it relates to um, alternative sensing. LEAD has an affiliate uh, agreement with Liberty University. We are an all-encompassing institute providing education, rehabilitation, and training. Like I said, a community correctional and training organization, building strong nations one community at a time. We have international, we have an international blended alternative school. We have a reentry center that is being developed here in Grand Bahama as we speak, and a transitional home. And also we have an international training center. And our courses are offered for those who have not finished their academics. Our courses are offered through Liberty University Online Academy. And we are registered and with Ministry of Education and with NACOP. And so our membership affiliates and sponsors include Ministry of Education, Templeton Foundation, U.S. Embassy, Lifeiki Foundation, Cable Cares Foundation, Commonwealth, the Colombo Plan International Center for Credential and Education of Addiction Professionals, and CCI Germantown, Tennessee. As we state, we have uh, four subsidiaries. We have Project Reentry Caribbean, which uh, came about three years ago out of Project Reentry Bahamas. We have Caribbean Correctional Training. We have Diversion, uh, Behavioral Healthcare Resources and Services and we have the Eagles Academy. The Eagles Academy basically is an international blended alternative school. Like I said, that affiliate um, with you know, Liberty University. It's affordable, it's accredited, it's flexible. It uses in a, a blended version in person now civics. And that's what uh, basically COVID-19 brought to us. Social skills training, leadership development, and one of our core key component MRT, which is a cognitive, one of the leading cognitive behavioral treatment programs on the SAMHSA scale of evidence-based best practices. And let me just move fast along. Also, um, I went over this with Liberty University Online Academy that we have, uh, Project Reentry Caribbean. Uh, this effective program basically is tailored for the individual using a research-driven process that begins when an offender is incarcerated and ends when he is fully or successfully reintegrated as a law-abiding citizen. And let me put a plug in here. Our reentry program works tandem with BDOC's reentry or BDOC's pre-release program. So actually our pre-release program is one component of BDOC's pre-release. So BDOC's is using evidence-based uh, research-driven programs in their case management system. So being a civilian and being a stakeholder, I would always continue to advocate for resources and services for that institution. Then we are uh, our pre-release program is one of the graduation that we would have had. Then our post-release uh, program, these are two former inmates who came through our post-release program at our center. And then uh, when we look at project reentry, like I stated before, begins working with inmates prior to their release through a structured group-based curriculum that is offered in designated prison facilities. Sessions assist inmates in preparing home plans through specific targeted and realistic topics related to transition. How the program works? Inmates can request to be referred to the pre-release program by the BDC as case manager if in any participating prison facility that's on BDOC's uh, ground, because all of the facilities, all of the different various prisons, the several different prisons are located in one basic area. Okay. Once approved, the inmate will, or uh, like the principal officer say, the client will begin project reentry pre release programming at the next scheduled program cycle start date. Then we have Caribbean correctional training, and that's self explanatory where everyone is affected by crime in some way. And as a community, we all pay the price. Every effort to create reform adds to our national quality of life. Caribbean Correctional Training LLC is actually licensed and established out of Raleigh, North Carolina. And we provide training. The reason why we did that is that when we provide training and services, we, have your, we give you your uh, credit hours, your CEUs, continuing education hours, 
and you get your certification that is internationally uh, accepted with uh, the Colombo Plan, ISOP, International Substance Use, uh, International Society of Substance Use Professionals as such. And these are some of our training that we would have conducted actually a year ago, two years ago. The gentleman you see right here where my cursor is, he is the head, he was the head of vision for mission in Trinidad and Tobago. And, you know, uh, Chris is, um, and I think Anne Marie is on this call, should know him as well. A uh, very good friend of mine. And he succumbed, I think was last year, last year or year before last? Time gone so fast, I can't remember, it was last year or year before last. But anyway, he succumbed to his illness. He was the founder of Vision for Mission in Trinidad and Tobago, one of the leading, I thought we were only ones who were doing what we're doing in the Caribbean, but he is way, he was like eons ahead of us down there in Trinidad and Tobago. And um, the EU, he got funding from the EU and he brought us down there to conduct training to train his entire staff uh, in certification of addiction profession, certification in cognitive behavior training, with alcohol and drug abuse training, counseling, emotional intelligence, and all of those things down there. And the beautiful thing is that all of his staff is an NGO. They are paid by, most of the staff, let me put it this way, are paid by the Ministry of National Security. And you know what? He is, or he was a former offender. He served time in the prison system in Trinidad. And he, he established the leading, the leading community correctional organization in, I would say, in the Southeastern Caribbean. And I took, I, 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 I tipped my hats off to him because he was really good. And also we trained persons out of Cayman Islands, uh, New Providence, and uh, 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 Cayman, and Nassau, Nassau, yeah, he did say Nassau, Trinidad and Tobago in the, in the bottom uh, photos here who did their certification. Then just not last year, just 2019, we, we would have trained over through Caribbean Correctional Training in Turks and Caicos, over 40 participants in MRT, psychologists, educators, psychiatrists, uh, guidance counselors, uh, police officers, uh, the whole nine yards. We were contracted by the Turks and Caicos government through the Department of Education to conduct training down there so that they can implement actually alternative sentencing in their prison system. And then we have diversion, behavioral health care, resources and services. And this is what I like because we actually uh, 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 refer out most of our clients in this program. And we use uh, MRT based on UTC or Universal Treatment Curriculum Programming to target and treat substance use disorder, anger management, codependency, parenting, job readiness, relapse prevention, trauma, mental health conduct disorder, opposition defined as order and all of these things can be treated from a community standpoint instead of custodial sentencing. Furthermore, MRT fosters moral development and treatment resistant clients through education, group and individual counseling and with structured exercise. So we focus on addiction, substance abuse, anger management, mental health and parenting program. And also we have what we call our pre-trial services that any person is caught with small amount of marijuana, they are given conditional discharge, sent to diversion behavioral care through lead. And once they complete the programs within the specified time of nine to 12 months, that individual is given a complete discharge. MRT group, we have juveniles and we have adults. This was a merge of juveniles. We had a Adults were sharing with the juveniles why they should not go their route in one of our sessions. We treat substance use disorder, anger management, job readiness, parenting, relapse prevention, conduct disorder, opposition defined disorder. And so this brings me to the end of our alternative sentencing program that we offer here in the Bahamas and also throughout the Caribbean and in the state of North Carolina. And so call to action for those of you who want to get involved you can give financial donations to help us uh, with our organization capacity to help us uh, implement and roll out more of our uh, uh, featured programs. 
You can do in-kind donations where uh, you can give actually uh, your time, your volunteerism, such. You could give monthly, you can give quarterly, or you can give yearly. So we spell thousands as T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D-S. -S. Question and answers. We have five minutes for question and answer before we move on. Any questions? Claire's mud. Yes, no questions. So I was clear as mud. Good. So our next step. Once you go or you give alternative sentencing through any viable organization that offers alternative sentencing programs and services, <clears throat> I believe strongly that you will create a more peaceful, safer, and productive nation. So those of you in the Caribbean, those of you who are in the Bahamas, alternative sentencing is the way to go with individuals. If you want to reduce the inmate population or the prison population, and if you want to rehabilitate individuals effectively, and also it's a good cost saving factor through alternative sentencing. Thank you very much for your time. I just see, saw um, Ellen Jordan, what I learned the most, oh, that was earlier this morning. Does the Institute sponsor courses to countries in the region? Yes, the Institute sponsor countries. And I, I, I shared with you, we did training in Turks and Caicos, Cayman Islands, St. Lucia, uh, Trinidad, in 2018, I was on a training course. Actually, I didn't, um, I not conducted, I pursued a training course with CARICOM and some of my friends should be online today in Guyana with a uh, correctional principal officer, uh, Travis Bow from the Department of Correctional Services. And hopefully we can get Travis Bow out of maximum so that he can work with restorative justice with the parole system. Thank you.